topic, as I said of my lecture, is the Ottoman heritage in Sweden, if you can call it that, with a very special focus on the 18th century, the late 18th century collection of paintings, which was brought to Sweden by the two brothers, Selsing, Gustav and Ulrich, who were Swedish ambassador to the Sultan and the Sublime Court at the end, or from the middle of the 18th century until almost the end of the 18th century. The collection uh, of paintings, which you will see pictures from it, is unique uh, from several aspects, art historically, and being connected with the same family for 250 years. We have a few other famous Ottoman collections in the world, but this is the one that has stayed exactly as it was brought together and stayed in the same family for such a long time. In the historical perspective, it may come as a surprise that a small country like Sweden in the far north of Europe was of any importance to Turkey, or for that matter, Turkey to Sweden. But diplomatic relations started already in the 16th century. And through the centuries gave birth, as I said, to a surprising rich Ottoman heritage now in Swedish museums, but also in the royal palaces. And what I will not talk about today are some of the objects which Nurham knows very well, a collection of Turkish tents, which was published in her book on the Ottoman tents. One is really grand, it was a royal tent and it was brought to Sweden in the early 18th century. We also have a nice collection of Bushak carpets, which has belonged to the royal family from the 17th century and on. And we have a few other objects, uh, which I, I will not go into. These were brought already in the 17th century. In the 18th century, which we are going to talk about today, uh, we have uh, two collections of drawings. One collection of drawing, one collection of paintings, sorry. And we also have a unique collection of paintings from the 17th century, these form the three, and you will see. I will come back to that. It ended in something that I'm not going to talk about today. When the two brothers Selsings had finished their career, we are at the end of the 18th century, and the whole of Europe was under the effect of, of the Turkish fashion. The Turquerie, as they call it in French. And you wouldn't believe that would reach as far out as in the northern countries of Europe. Mm -hmm. But we had a king, Gustavus III, who was extremely well educated, uh, a king of the arts as well. He spoke fluent French, that was his daily language to use also in Sweden. And so he picked up this fashion from Europe, not directly from Turkey. He could have taken it from the Turkish ambassadors, but he did not. But this sort of ended the 18th century. And as you will soon know, uh, soon know from what I will talk about, is that, that from the early uh, 18th century until today, the Sweden has had diplomatic relations and a permanent embassy, first of course in Istanbul, now it is in Ankara, but we continue here in the Swedish palace down in Beirut. I suppose you all know it. And uh, there we have been since 1757. So in the 19th century, there were a lot of famous Swedish families uh, had somebody in the family coming here. It is interesting to see how many have been here. And that, of course, also makes a nice connection and I talk about this in Sweden. And some of these diplomats, as should be, were well trained in painting watercolors, so we have some nice collections. I'm not going to talk about them today. One is really, really important. We can talk about that the next time. Um, I'm staying with the six, 17th century and the 18th century. And we start with an ambassador who came, not uh, as a regular or proper ambassador. He was sent by the Swedish king to try to persuade the Ottoman Sultan, who was a very young man at the time, it was Mehmed IV, that, uh, he, that Sweden was, as it has always been, 
Turkish best friend. We never had conflicts in Turkey from Swedish side. And why would he do that? Well, Sweden in the 17th century was a power in Europe. And between Sweden and Turkey, or east of the two, north of you, we had Russia. Russia was an eternal enemy to Sweden, more or less. And Roland sought, sent by the king to persuade the Sultan that the friendship between the two countries was important. I won't go into that because it, that is a lecture in itself. When he published the book, The Sultan's Procession, about the embassy of Klaus Roland. But it left a remarkable result. Although his mission failed for many reasons, after him, we have an amazing collection of 20 big paintings. And they are now in the Nordic Museum in Stockholm. I only took out one of them, and that is the one with the Sultan himself. <coughs> what you see here is part of a long parade. All the paintings have the same parade. And Roland wrote a most funny diary, a whole book from the month, from when he started out from Sweden in April, May 1657, until he returned and was back in Sweden in February 1658. He was here through the winter, and it wasn't easy. He says, it was so cold on the way back to Sweden that the birds turned back south <laughs> and froze in the air, more or less. But during these months, and this was in September, he watched the parade when Mehmed III was moving from Istanbul, Constantinople, as he said at the time, to Edirne, or Adrianople. And in uh, all the paintings are on uh, or has a, not a number but a, a letter. So this is S, very appropriate for the Sultan, and it's one of the last. And in all these paintings, uh, it is told in Swedish who you see. I won't go into that, but the Sultan is, of course, here. When we were studying these paintings, and we've done so for many years, and the book is a, a, a cooperation between several researchers, uh, we were frustrated because we couldn't find out who painted the paintings, nor where they were painted. We tried to mobilize all Swedish experts in the 17th century, got little help. Of course, it could have been painted in Sweden if you look at the technique. It's painted with oil on canvas. Uh, but who in Sweden would know all these details about the Ottoman functionaries? And who could, how could Roland himself, although he had been here, for some months, be able to give the details of this. And there is definitely a character in the painting which is not Swedish either. So the enigma persists, is still there. But we have made the best we can to introduce this to an international public so that the research can continue. There are no, um, there is, is nothing to help us. Roland doesn't even mention the paintings himself. We can't see in the money he spent when he was here if he spent money on anything related to the paintings. He mentions everything from the bread that was bought every day to the horse that he bought and the diamond he bought for his wife. But nothing about paintings. You can see that it wasn't an easy thing. But I think they definitely deserve to be known. In his hands was also a small book of the kind that so many had. I think many of you are very familiar with this just this uh, group of, of paintings. And he had almost 130 from the beginning. Uh, they are a little fewer now. They are bound into a book, and they are in the Royal Library in Stockholm. So Klaus Roland came as a single star, left this really nice diary that I think should be translated into English so you can all read it. And he, we have his paintings. We have this little book with uh, what people looked like in the Ottoman society. And then nothing happened. He came back to Sweden, the king died. He continued on something else. He never even, in there have been other books published about him now, he doesn't even mention Turkey anymore, or Constantinople. So 50 years passed. And then, I don't know how many of you know this, 
but I think you've heard sometimes about the Swedish king that came to the Ottoman Empire in 1709. He wasn't allowed to Constantinople. He stayed in Moldova, as we say today, uh, outside the Bender Fortress, which was in fact, if not constructed, but anyway designed by Sinan, and is much reconstructed today. In a small village, he put up camp. He was the king's, no, sorry, the sultan's guest. And he really wanted to go back to Sweden, but again it was the Russians that united his interests with the interests of the Ottoman sublime port or the sultan. And the years went on. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the sultan in exile in Sweden for five years, governing his empire from there? And so did this king. He was quite a powerful warrior. But it wasn't only that. <coughs> so from that camp up in Moldova, he established an embassy here, a temporary embassy, and that was the beginning of it all. They were in Pera. And he sent three expeditions out to see what he could not go and see himself. They went all the way down to Egypt. The first expedition, the most important one for us, these three people, uh, three of his officers, young, uh, young men, they all returned safe and sound. A second expedition, which was a young priest, he wasn't safe and sound, it was a sad story. But he brought an important painting, which you'll see. You'll see. And uh, a third expedition, which didn't contribute any visual material, so I'm not talking about it today. Cornelius Luce made 250 drawings. 42 of them are left and kept in the National Library, the National Museum in Stockholm. The rest was destroyed when finally uh, the Turks, as we say, tired of the king being there and with requiring more and more and more for his staying and his living, they had enough. They made what we call in Swedish, which is a very famous word in Sweden, the Kalamalik. <laughs> which simply meant that there was an uproar, we want the king to leave, please. So they set fire to his house and the drawings burned. So Kalavalik and Dolma, for all that matter, uh, is very, are very often used verses, Swedish, believe it or not. So we are actually now working on a book. Both Gunsebrenda and Nurhanata Soy are helping in that book about these drawings by Cornelius Luce. And among the drawings is a big panorama. I have only a small piece of one part of it. It continues. And you can very well see where we are. The top of the palace and there. It's all drawn in, in, uh, in uh, ink and colored by himself. And now we know that he was here in 1709 and 1710. So now we have, it's easy for us. We don't have the problem who was the artist and where were they done. But there are other enigmas in this collection as well. And this is just a little part of what I'm going to talk about. So I won't linger long on that. But he made two interiors, as you can see from the Aya Sophia. And that, of course, raises the question, how could he, in such a short time, produce 250 paintings or drawings? He was working hard during the months when he stayed in Constantinople. But he must have seen other people's work, <coughs> uh, probably, as well. This is quite well known to you. What is interesting in this picture, and it's not the only one, it's good to see that the frescoes are already in the mosaics were kept there in 1710 and not painted over. So the young priest also went down to Egypt. He wasn't so well. He returned to Sweden before the king. And uh, he was made professor. He was 32 or something. And uh, got a cold. When he, at the, uh, when he was inaugurated in his profession and died. So he left a collection of manuscripts, and I forgot to say we do have quite a lot of important manuscripts, both illustrated and not in the Swedish collections, but also this big painting of Mecca. 
And we know for sure that it was bought in 1710. And we have not been able to see that it was bought in Cairo. Mm -hmm. But this, this is again a problem because we don't know who painted it. We have nothing to compare with at that time. There is no painting so detailed from that period. Of course, there is a lot of Mecca paintings in all different media, from tiles to prayer books to paintings on the wall, paintings on, on mimbars. But this is painted on canvas in oil. And it's not only what you see, because what you can't see on this picture that there is an inscription on every house in red ink that tells what it is. And um, all this has now been read and is going to be published in the book. So there you are. Now, Roland, who was not connected sort of with anything but the king and the sultan, left no marks but his paintings. Then the story begins with Charles XII, 1709 to 14, the loose paintings, the Mecca painting, and then in, would you soon see pictures of it, the king left with big debts. So the sultan sent two embassies to Sweden to try to get some money back or run the city. You'll soon see them in picture. But with that starts another story. Because in 1734, the Swedes established an embassy here. And the Gustav Selsing, who came in 1746, he was the son of young, one of the young secretaries to the king who stayed here in Constantinople in the first embassy, 1709-14. And that young Gustav, his father, he got so taken by the whole of this Ottoman society and the grand city, and he learned Turkish. So when he came back to Sweden, he taught his two sons, Gustav and Ulrich, Turkish. And believe it or not, they also studied Turkish at Uppsala University in the middle of the 18th century. And the first to came, come here was Gustav in 1746. And he was the one who bought the property where the Swedish consulate is now and the Swedish embassy was from that time. He stayed until 72. His uh, younger brother came before that. This isn't quite correct. I'm sorry, I apologize about that. But he was formally appointed ambassador from 72 to 79. So this Selsin family had a presence, more or less, in Turkey from 1709 to 1779. And this is still, I must say, the big thing in the Selsin family, 200 and more years after. They, uh, this was an important thing in the family, of course. And his two <coughs> brothers had a long period of life here in Pera, in this place, and also in Büyükdere and Karabia, where they went for a summer vacation, as most diplomats did at the time. But what made them different from most in their time, as I said, was the collection of paintings that they ordered here in Constantinople and took back to Sweden. It was not immediately put in this house which they bought together. It was uh, on the walls of their apartment in Stockholm and that apartment was just opposite the royal palace. And it was the time of this king of culture and arts, Gustavus III, so I'm sure he had visited their apartments and seen what there was. But in the early 19th century, after the two brothers had died, the collection was brought out in the country of Sweden, in the country of Sörmland, which is west of Stockholm, and put on the walls in this place. And ever since I learned about it, there has been this fear that will this house burn? Mm -hmm. It is a wooden mansion. The Turkish collection is behind these doors and spread over the house. Uh, it is a dangerous place. And I can tell you now, before I start talking, that the house has recently been sold. Mm -hmm. That is a long story, but it has to be sold. The four brothers and sisters who inherited from their parents cannot keep it, and the collection is in danger 
we don't know how to keep it in Sweden and we are fighting to raise the money that it would take to keep it, but we don't know if we can do it. So I need not be afraid that it will burn for much longer. I would rather be afraid of that than what will happen with the collection now. A hundred and two paintings and more of costume, single sheets of costume paintings in the 18th century style and model. But the most interesting is the collection of 102. And there is a great variety of pictures in that, small and big, some rather big. Four depict the two brothers being received by the Sultan. And and, and the Grand Vizier. So this is Gustav sitting here with his entourage mixed. And um, with the, the Sultan Mustafa III, here he is standing. I think this is, should be him. Mm. Again, his younger brother Ulrich, pretty much later, and, and Ulrich here with Abdelhamid the first and his sons present, as you can see. I think you are familiar with these paintings, not exactly this one, but the many others that were painted by the same atelier and in the same style. Uh, we don't know who painted these exactly, but it's less important we look at the other paintings. But this is the basis sort of, of the collection, the, the visual uh, evidence of them having been there, and of course of importance to the family, and there are studies of these paintings as well. When you enter this house, and many of you have been there, I know, and Gensel and Nurhan have definitely been there. You enter in a hall, and there are the paintings from the landscapes around the Bosphorus. But, and to the right is the so-called Turkish room, and to the left is a big drawing room where you see a big panorama in two parts. This is the left part. It's easy for you to identify the Galata Tower, which is in the center of the other, uh, in corresponding to the same <coughs> part of the Galata Tower on this side, and the Topkapi Bruno, and uh, and of course the Mamra Sea at the far end. And it is probably painted, I'm sorry that the picture is too big to come out well in detail and the light here is a little strong too. Uh, painted, should be painted from the Swedish property, but it's probably painted from the Russian. So you see there is a garden in the foreground. There are also people on the terraces here and the buildings cover all the slope down to the shore. Of, of the uh, of the bus process it is on this side. And this is the other part. Here is the Galata Tunnel, of course. And it continues up to the end of the Golden Horn. Here are the graveyards. Uh, that part of them still exists today. In this room is also are also the audience paintings that you just saw and a view over Iskidar, which you will see at the end of this presentation. This was, there is no, and this is the little bit surprising character of the collection. If you are a diplomat in Constantinople, or if you are a visitor and a tourist, what is the focus of your first visit at least? Istanbul is the historic city and its places and the mos mosques the Hippodrome, up made on it. There is nothing of that in this collection. The panorama is the only painting that puts them in place because it is from where they lived in Pera, the view they had from the residents in Pera every day. And it is beautifully described by a little later traveler in 78 who says that this is miraculous, this is magnificent. 
the view that you see and what you can see from there. That is what they wanted. But they have, there's no painting of the house they lived in. It was a small pavilion at the time, not what you see today. But they have paintings from Taragia, where they spent the summer. And the landscapes, as you soon will see, is from the Belgrade forest or the Bosphorus, where they went for leisure, but not the prof prof professional places where they had to go. So here is a crowd on the shore uh, of Tarabia with the houses that we recognize so well, and the boat is waiting for them. And there is also a I don't think I included it here, no, there's a sketch uh, of this as well. So this is the only painting that is really connected with the life of the two brothers. Uh, we know uh, Ulrich, that he, they, he also stayed in, the younger brother also stayed in Vigdere, but we had from, from Sweden no permanent uh, jolle or house on the Bosphorus, so they, they could, could move. From to where they preferred. I'm not sure they have a picture of the hall. I have the paintings, but when you enter, when you go to your right, then you enter the Turkish room, and as you can see, this Turkish room, which is quite nicely made, is maybe not a copy of a divan. It's more the idea of a divan, mm -hmm. with a mixture of eclectic things, the divan sofas that they have made in the families, mixed with Swedish furniture of the period of the 18th century, a table which is Syrian in kind. But on the walls are the two groups of landscape paintings which you will soon see, and some of the many paintings and drawings and aquarels or watercolors of, of Turkish uh, people. We call them costume albums, but this is, of course, portraits of Turkish people in the Ottoman society. And um, in this room you also find two big paintings of these Ottoman uh, embassies that came to Sweden. Uh, Mustafa Effendi or in 1733. Uh, it was Said Mehmet Effendi who came on the second uh, mission. The same Said Mehmet Effendi who was working with with, with Ferica, um, uh, in his young age. These big paintings are different from the collection, the other part of the collection, because they were painted much earlier by a Swedish painter. He was the court painter, Georg Engelhard Skröder. And the paintings were probably painted at the same time as these two embassies came to Sweden. So what we do not know and cannot yet trace in the family is who bought these paintings. Uh, they were probably acquired by the father, but they are exhibited in this Turkish room, because the Turkish room is collecting the best of the paintings in the collection. Maybe I should go back. Uh, and I think that you have all seen copies of these paintings in Pera Museum bought at an auction, and this is not so strange because even if these were, were coming directly into the hands of the family and small copies are kept in the National Museum collections as part of what was once the Royal Collection. When, as Ginsel knows so well, has been working with us on the Bibi Collection, when the painter died, they found in his workshop or in his atelier a whole lot of these paintings. Copies probably made for Swedes who wanted to acquire the paintings or he tried to sell to them. His widow had kept them. So now and then there appear more or less good uh, copies of these, of these paintings in auctions in Sweden and are spread internationally. Quite attractive today. And the most impressive of all are, is the big Ottoman genealogical tree. It is an oak. I think it should be a chinar, shouldn't it? But anyway, it is more than three meters high. 
is really big. And there are two more copies of this tree. One was in the royal possession, and a third went to the Ottoman Sultan. Gilson knows this story much better than I do, but uh, she has written about it. But as you all can see, it's made up of individual portraits of the kind that we could see in the collection, hanging on the walls on the side of the landscape paintings. And all these were brought together uh, in this way, and it was the idea of the king who had been introduced to these portraits of the sultans that they should come together from Osman I up to Abdul Hamid I, uh, from down and up, of course, united by this blue silk ribbon to show how they entered into history until the time of Ulrich Selsing when he left. And this is quite also a unique painting. It is the first of these kind of paintings which were then became a fashion and you have seen many uh, of the same kind but in different style and from different periods exhibited here in exhibitions or portraits of the Ottoman Sultans. But this is a really impressive painting in the collection. <coughs> Maybe more unusual and in fact quite unique are the landscape paintings that you saw were in two groups on the walls in this Turkish room. The big painting from Kaitane with the Sultan's palace and the water reservoirs or ponds, if you like, and the forest behind. We do know other representations of this place. We do know other pictures of this place, but none from the same period and none uh, in this uh, manner. And the Besiktas Sarai, or the, the, the mm -hmm. palace that was in Besiktas, not gone, of course. Mm -hmm. So it is also a painting. There are other paintings of this palace. Uh, but this one is very detailed, and we can also date it safely uh, to, to the period when it was made. And it's, again, a rather unique document of the palace from the time. In combination with these, there are some paintings on palaces now completely gone, from the, mainly from, from the area around the royal palaces or up, a little bit up from Bosphorus, probably in the Belgrade Forest. They are quite impressive, uh, these buildings, which are now gone, probably most made in, in wood with some substructures. And garden these pavilions. Garden pavilions, but so big. Big also. Yes. And, and these very nice this gardens, uh, which are characteristic also from the period. And mentioned in, in the literature, they were all planted with flowers. You've seen them recently, top of the palace, but they took them away now. And, uh, and between the, the plantations, there are walks set with these characteristic round stones in pattern black and white. So the literature tells us. And some figures appear here and there. They look like they were taken from these sheets of Ottoman people, the paintings of Ottoman people that were in the Sarsin collection, almost like taped onto to these uh, paintings. They're very stereotyped, but made to amuse. And the life that you are also familiar with, up in the Belgrade forest, mm -hmm. in the waters, uh, mainly Europeans, I mean, with this decolletage, mm -hmm. whatever, wherever they came from. Uh, but it, it gives a very gay and nice impression of, of life in the forest. Again, with one of these pavilions, of course, gone now, and a little bridge and a carriage. And life on the Bosphorus as well. <coughs> Some of the buildings, uh, like this rather uh, connect than the other. And, and we, don't, I, we don't know exactly where it is. Maybe you can identify it. We didn't dare to tell exactly where it was. And then out on the water, 
that interested the two brothers, or particularly Ulrich, who was probably more connected with these later paintings, with the water and the and the, 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 the boats and the and the seasides mm -hmm. and the room Lisa. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I think it is the room Lisa and another Lisa on the other side is mm -hmm. another. And also, finally, I think finally, because this is just a glimpse of what it is of the uh, no the aqueduct in the Belgrade Fort. No, it continues. I'm sorry. This is, I think, the final uh, picture that I chose. Is a view uh, over Iskudar from the other uh, from the Asian side. 102 pictures, 26 or 27 of major importance or major size. Most of which you see now, but there are a few more from the Belgrade Forest and a few more from the Bosphorus of the same kind. But together, they make up a collection of a kind that you have nothing corresponding to it. There was no uh, painting of, of landscapes of this kind in this period here in Turkey. And these were, of course, foreign artists who were working for the Selsing brothers. And then, when we were working on the book that we published uh, in 2003, I think, uh, it was in Swedish, it was called Minnet of Constantinople, would be translated the memory of Constantinople. Well, illustrated, but unfortunately not one of these big, beautiful books that you get here. <laughs> it was a rather small Swedish book, but it was anyway illustrations in color. We have been working hard on this collection together. We have tried every way of finding out who were the painters that the two Selsing brothers could have met here or could have asked to paint. Quite an important collection, must have taken quite a long time to do it, but we had no signatures. We had nothing to help us. And then a strange thing happened. When the old parents died, the two parents, or the father, Selsing at the time, with whom we had met, when he died, the four sisters and brothers, as I said, would take over, inherit the place and the collection. And they went through everything. And they found a suitcase, or I don't know what you call it in English, I should have looked it up, a bigger thing that you travel with in old times. A chest, it is. And it had a label on it which said, Can, should not be opened for it to open us. <laughs> and this very obedient Frederick Selsing, the father of these four, mm -hmm. had probably never dared to open it because this was written by his father mm -hmm. in the very early 20th century. And when they opened it, they found maps, mm -hmm. they found papers of different kinds, <coughs> and they found letters. Among these, Five letters, which gave the clue. With only two signed by two painters, mm -hmm. and one telling about a third, and another letter, like an inventory or part of an inventory of the of the paintings, probably done when they were sent to Sweden in seventy nine. We have been able to piece it together. We had already guessed that the painter that we didn't know exactly the name, Jan van der Steen or Adrian van der Steen, we found out later, a Dutch painter, and we had compared a panorama by him in the Rijks Museum. I thought he had something to do with, with it. We also knew from uh, a traveler who had visited the, the, and written in his diary. Uh, visited the Selsing brothers, traveler from Sweden, he said there is a painter working in the Swedish palace. We know there was a painter working in the Swedish palace. And then we tried to see uh, from the style of these paintings who could have worked otherwise. And we now found three names. Francis or François Smith, Antoine de Fabre, and Adrian van der Steen. 
And it seems it wasn't Adrian van der Steen who painted the panorama, but he probably painted all the landscape paintings from the Berlin Forest and the Bosphorus. Uh, it was probably, now I have to read again, although I've written it myself, uh, that, uh, um, that uh, de Fabre made the audience paintings. After all, it wasn't from the Van Moore at the yes, he saw it at the time. And so finally it was, uh, where am I now? Am I? Uh, Francois or Francis, it depends how we prefer to pronounce his name, Smith who made the panorama. We have almost pieced it together and it seemed it was such a surprise that we would ever be able to do this, but there is still work to be done. Well, this is important for us in Sweden, but it is important to you as well. First of all, through these only five letters, you can see how they talk about each other. Francis Smith was introduced by uh, a consul, by all means, from Malaga. No, from, from, uh, from uh, Malta. They are very connected in Malta. And, and again then to London. Was introduced by a consul uh, staying mainly in Malta. The other two are talking about each other. They say, he's such nice company. Or they say, he is such a good painter. Or that one we have known for a long time. We know that he will make something <coughs> really interesting when he comes to Istanbul. So this has been a great pleasure. I mean, it's really bold to us. So we know more about the Selsen collection. However, poor equality it may seem to you. That is almost to say too much. It is a poor in quality, but it is also not painting of, of grand style. But I think the, uh, some of the Bosphorus paintings are really good, and some of these landscapes, the six landscape paintings in the Turkish ruins are excellent. Together with the panorama, we also have an interesting contribution to the, the traditional painting panoramas of Constantinople that, of course, started already in the 16th century. And again, even if the quality is not that, what makes it most interesting, what makes it so interesting is that this is a collection that we can connect so well in time and so well with the persons who ordered the paintings to be made. And as part of what happened in the diplomatic circles up here uh, in, in Bailo and the life the diplomats lived in connection with the artists. Mm. There is more to <coughs> discover in that. And of course you know much more about the painters connected with the big embassies as we call them. Sweden may feel themselves important, but it wasn't, although the Swedish palace was a beautiful building, it wasn't any one of the most important embassies. But you can, I would like to repeat, isn't it a bit surprising that it really isn't such a small country, it's almost half of Turkey, but it seems small up there and far away up in the north that in Sweden you will find at least three unique collections of paintings of rather big importance and one absolutely unique painting of Mecca. We have a few more things too, but I'm not talking about them today. <laughs> so, so it's been, uh, of course, a challenge and a pleasure to work with these collections through the years. <coughs> and I wish we could bring it out to more of you to contribute your knowledge where we have not been able to find it. So thank you very much. Thank you.